Hello. For this episode of Airs for Architecture, I spoke with Katie Lloyd Thomas, Professor of Architectural History and Theory at Newcastle University, about her book Building Materials, Material Theory and the Architectural Specification, published by Bloomsbury in 2021, and the forthcoming conference, Production Studies 2024, Transforming Knowledges of Architecture, Design and Labour, taking place at Newcastle University on the 25th to the 28th of March. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm speaking today to Professor Katie Lloyd Thomas um, about her recent book, her 2022 book, uh, Building Materials, Material Theory and the Architectural Specification, published by Bloomsbury. Um, But before we get into the book, Katie, perhaps you'd be so kind as to introduce yourself. Hello, yes. So I'm Katie Lloyd Thomas and I teach at Newcastle University. Um, I did train as an architect, um, but I, in fact, I never finished my part three. So I probably worked as an architect uh, intermittently up until I was about 30 and then started to get into um, uh, academia and in teaching and uh, and research and I did a PhD quite late um, in in my 30s and the book building materials actually comes out of some of the research um, for that uh, for that PhD it took me a long time to uh, to write it and get it published um, so where did you study uh, architecture to begin with <laughs> I did my undergraduate degree at Cambridge. Um, I took three years out, which was quite unusual in between. In practice. In practice. Yeah. In practice I went and volunteered uh, with a um, an NGO in Thailand who were working with um, uh, slum dwellers who were facing eviction, actually. And uh, and then I went back to University of East London. I was really um, keen to go somewhere where... In fact, where making uh, was high on the agenda more than um, talking about architecture, which was something that happened a lot at Cambridge at the time. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, I had a really good two years uh, at University of East London. And then I did a master's at, mm-hmm. um, uh, at Nottingham. It was called the Master's in Architecture and Critical Theory, which Neil Leach ran for some years. And that was that was really transformational, I think, for me, a turning point. Mm-hmm. Um what does architectural and critical theory look like? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I suppose what Neil Leach was interested in doing was um, working with people trained in architecture or interested in architecture and looking at some of the key texts that had come out at that time, often that would directly talk about architecture or space. Uh, so we would look at, um, you know, Michel Foucault, at Derrida, at Deleuze, um, at some some of the sort of uh, feminist and psychoanalytic thinkers at the time, people like Julia Kristeva or Hélène Sissou. So we were almost looking at sort of a critical theory writer uh, each week um, or philosopher and thinking about what their um, their ideas had to do with architecture. And that kind of pushed you towards, away from, I suppose, the building towards the text, which is kind of part of, partly, what building materials is about. Yeah, that's right, because building materials both looks at the work of a philosopher, at uh, Gilbert Simondon's work, and also at the architectural specification, which is a textual document. That's probably the best way to define it. The drawing is a drawing, and the specification describes a building in words. And yeah, I think that's uh, that's right. The PhD, it took me some time uh, to do a PhD after the master's. And actually, when I started the research, the question that was really on my mind um, was probably a more abstract question uh, than comes up in the book. And that was a question about materiality. I I um, I had got really interested in the idea that materials might in some way be political, that uh, that we thought a lot about how, you know, discourse expressed sort of political ideas or could be politically persuasive. Uh, and um, but I was interested in the idea that material materiality might be. And I mean, materiality in a really wide 
sort of way. So, you know, when you go to a political protest, it's not just what is said uh, that sort of inspires you politically or produces change, but something about the kind of the voice of the, the, the you know, in which things are said or the materiality or the sort of the materiality in the uh, of the bodies that are around you. And um, so I had this kind of this this was the kind of question uh, in my mind that I started with. And in fact, I did quite a lot of reading. I was mostly looking at fine art and at poetry at the beginning of uh, of my my PhD research. Um, and what I got really interested in was how language describes materials and the materiality of language. So not just spoken language, but literally, you know, a letter on a page has a kind of fleshy quality, um, literally an inky quality. And what was the relationship then between almost the meaning and the kind of materiality of, uh, of language? And... And then literally I just started to remember something from uh, from the days when I had been working as a jobbing sort of architect and I'd written specifications. Um, and and that was that we had different ways when we wrote a specification of describing materials. Um, so on the one hand, we might just name a material. We must you know, just say the kind of wood we wanted uh, or the kind of brick. Um, uh, on the other, we might describe, you know, how to maybe how to mix a concrete or the recipe for a concrete uh, in the specification. This happens less now than it did in the days I was sort of handwriting specifications for a small practice. And then uh, also the performance specification, which is maybe the most interesting form of specification, which describes the material through what it does. So how it's going to act how uh, how much light a material should let through, how much sound and so on. And it really was like a, a hunch at the time that this was something interesting in this. In a way, there was a correspondence. This is what fascinated me at first, a correspondence between the material and the way it was written about. That was what I thought at first anyway. Uh, and so my, dis my my PhD research took a very different uh, direction. Um, and I wanted to find out if this idea about specifications was in any way true. Uh, I knew that, you know, they were an incredible resource for, for finding writing about materials that comes out of architectural practice. But um, I, I didn't know if this kind of hunch about the different forms of description would uh, would bear out. And I certainly didn't know um, what that might look like historically, you know, if I uh, moved away from the ones that I'd been writing in my uh, in my architect's office in Clapham in the 2000s, you know, to start looking more widely. And in fact, there was almost no, uh, there was no historical work on specifications. There was very uh, little to help me. I just had to start finding documents and reading them myself, I guess. Um, uh, in general, they're not much collected. Uh, archives like drawings, they don't like, they don't like all the kind of bureaucratic administrative uh, stuff. Um, uh, mostly I use the RIBA archives um, and I would, you know, try and get specifications from architects, which sometimes proved actually very difficult to do. Um, so uh, because they don't keep them or because they constitute some form of slightly protected legal thing or uh, absolutely the latter i mean i think they do keep them because they they're so important legally um uh so you know you could easily you know be sued for having you know uh put the wrong thing in a specification or similarly you know if it turned out that a defect uh was the you know had been caused by some you know the book the contractor not following the specification mm -hmm. so they're really important uh to keep but that's absolutely right. Um, because of that anxiety, uh, be because of sort of anxiety around libel largely, um, especially the bigger architects uh, didn't want to give me access to their specifications. Um, I imagine that, I imagine that, I mean, post Grenfell, and uh, this is uh, slightly uh, oblique to our, to the general trajectory of the conversation 
but post Grenfell, the specification must have been explored a huge amount during the during the um, the investigation into that disaster because it was a specifying problem. That's right, and it it's a really good point. Um, and quite often, I mean, pre Grenfell talking about the specification and how important it, it was, how important the specification of materials was, uh, how um, how much it mattered, who mm. did that specifying. And I mean, the, the specif- you know, the specification now um, uh, is, is written in such a way often that architects don't uh, select materials, in fact, must not select materials either to reduce their liability or just to give the contractor um, much more freedom to do do things the sort of cheapest way. All of those things, I think, were quite difficult for people to um, see and understand, especially if they were outside the kind of industry pre-Grenfell. But post-Grenfell, it became really obvious that uh, I suppose that that these sorts of questions really, really mattered. Um, so it, it was, it was actually, it was a big change in the kind of reception of of my research too, mm-hmm. and the kinds of conversations that you know that I would have if I would talk about it. People can suddenly uh, see the urgency. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that sort of makes sense about the kind of um, the moment that this book sits within. It's, it's, it's sort of super timely in that respect because we are, and we'll talk about this, I think, a little bit later. But we're 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 entering a phase in which materials have a much more heightened political agency than perhaps they have before. But perhaps, I'm sort of I sort of want to kind of set the ground plane for for this discussion. You've talked about you know your your background within critical theory and this idea, in a way. I suppose, of the specification as a form of literature. Mm -hmm. And you mention also, I think, that the specification actually is the more abundant instrument of architectural production than the drawing. But the drawing is what we like to be judged on as architects. But perhaps we can come to this idea of the what's called the material turn. I think you you referenced the material turn in 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 um in theory. And I and I wondered whether you might sort of position that uh, and 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 the work in relation to this material turn what is the material turn i suppose <laughs> yeah i think i perfectly embody the material turn so i guess it was i suppose at least if we look think about it from the perspective of architecture there was a period in the 80s and 90s um perhaps even going back to the 70s where people were really interested in questions around meaning and signification and the kind of the language of architecture and in a way you almost read architecture as a kind of uh, a series of signs a sort of you know as a as a discourse and this you know comes out of the structuralism of the 60s and 70s so and i think um and and then what you get at least in architectural discourse, um, is interesting to think about it across other disciplines as well, is a, a, a much more interest in um in the 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 building as a as a thing, as a, you know, as a as a material, as a material object, and a kind of turn away from this sort of a discursive ap- approach to um to buildings but I have to say that um that didn't mean immediately that people were actually uh, very interested in um uh materials as kind of um as, as commodities I mean they were interested there was an interest in the body and how you know how materials might be experienced there was also really importantly the interest you know the questions around um the environment and sustainability so that's really i think fed uh fed the material turn and been really important as well in terms of starting to think about extraction and the whole life cycle of material so that mm-hmm. i think that changed you know changed our way of thinking tending to focus on materials as uh you know part of a static structure to starting to see that they had um 
that they had a complex life where they went through many, um, you know, many different um, uh, mutations and forms. Um, but it's th this thing that you kind of, again, you intimate at the beginning, which is around the idea of architecture being more than just the building. And in fact, more than just the site, but this material turn and the way that, in your case, the specification indicates a <clears throat> a host of kind of connected enterprises, agencies, processes, which also are significant in the production of buildings. Yeah, I think that's really, um, that's exactly right. So I think if you look at a drawing of a building, you can almost forget uh, all of those, you know, mm. all of those factors. I mean, of course, and the materials, I mean, there might be notes on a drawing saying something about the materials. They're almost disappeared as well in, mm -hmm. in a drawing. Um, but if you look at the specification and initially, I mean, I looked at the specification, like I said, I was just interested in these descriptions and, you mm. know, um, uh, and I, I really just wanted to find descriptions of materials. You can't help but see the um, the real processes through which buildings come, you know, come into existence. So you know the the surveyors, the the car, you know, if we go back in time, the carpenters, the accountants, you know, the inspectors, all the kind of. Um, that well, that will be true in older in older specifications. Today, we'll see different we'll see different things in a performance specification. We'll we'll see a very sort of abstracted language, which also reveals to us we can only understand why that language is the way it is by starting to think about how the building industry is organised. Uh, so there is something where all of that kind of the the work the pragmatic world in which buildings um, emerge. Um, becomes very visible, Im impossible not to see. Um, mm -hmm. And these descriptions that I was interested in aren't descriptions which you could you sort of just choose. You know, I think today I'm going to describe a material by how it's uh, mixed up on site. Um, but, you know, tomorrow I think I'm going to just name it. They're not really choices. They're things which emerge again because the building industry is organized in a particular way. So I had no intention, actually, when I did the research, I had no intention to engage with all of this. I was probably quite resistant at the beginning, um, but there was no way of explaining what I was looking at without starting to understand the building industry. So it was really interesting that you could look at drawings and uh and never engage um but you just couldn't do the same with uh with this with the specification mm -hmm. so there's this idea i mean maybe maybe it would be worth thinking about how to kind of explain the unpacking of the book because you've 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 talked already about the, this these kinds of th three types of specifications this this um timeline of specification changes mm -hmm. from a kind of purely descriptive and then through to a kind of process of their production and use on site to mm -hmm. to this performance thing. Perhaps perhaps a kind of idea of that chronology would be useful. <laughs> okay, that's quite a big that that is a big question. And one of the things is uh, that very often all of these types will coexist, uh, mm -hmm. could coexist in the specification, and um, so. Although there is a degree of timeline to it, um, they also all the types you can you know you can find in old specifications yeah. and uh, you know in newer ones. And I think it's also important to say that the because the timeline and the changes um, relate to the organization of the building industry, it's very dependent on uh, where in the world you're looking at a specification because. Mm -hmm building cultures and building industries um develop and change in really radically different ways around uh around the world so those are some caveats <laughs> in a but in a in a very simple way um so the most sort of simple uh way of naming of describing a material in the specification and you you know you see this uh you know just in a kind of almost like a accountant sort of list of materials when they're trying to price a building in advance of it happening 
um, is just to name, uh, you know, to name the material. So, you know, is it going to be oak? Is it going to be um, beech? Is it going to be uh, uh, pine? Those, you know, those very sort of simple ways of, uh, dis- of not even describing materials, just literally you're naming them. Uh, and in the book, I do use timbers as a way to explore naming uh, materials. And even that changes in interesting ways as well um, through time. And so that I suppose that, you know, that's the dominant way. And that's, you know, perhaps, you know, all this, the oldest way. And then one of the most in, interesting, um, rich and lovely to read for sure, um, form of description is the process based, uh, what I call the process based clause. So that's, yeah, say when you get um, uh it will probably be a number of clauses explaining exactly how you're going to make up some concrete on site. You've got to just, you you, you describe it like a recipe. It's you you have to give the ingredients, but also what's going to be done on site. So you're thinking of material as something which is uh, made. And in Britain, at least, that starts to emerge in specifications in the late 18th century. And it really is a very dominant form of clause um, not for all materials, some of them don't, you know, um, go very well with a process based description, but it's very, very dominant really right up until the sort of 60s and 70s in the 20th century. So uh, a very, a very long span. And it turns out that that's really related to the sort of moment of the building industry becoming uh, a capitalist building industry, a sort of full blown capitalist industry. It's probably yeah, this complicated to explain. What do you mean by capitalist? Do you mean like a set within a kind of global economy or do you mean something that is entirely profit orientated or do you mean you a, that's the question that's immediately coming to mind? Like what kind of builders were yeah. descriptive and very precise specifications being given to? So let's say we're sort of we're in the middle of the 18th century. As I often do, as I often do. (laughs) And we're building a nice townhouse in the centre of uh, London, a grand townhouse in the centre of London. So one of the specifications I talk about in the book at length is is, is it doing exactly that. And all of that does, it's a bit like it just describes the lowest floor first and it tells you what beams you're going to need, how long they're going to be and what wood they're going to be. What, what would you need, you know? So is it oak or beech or whatever? Uh, and it just progresses. It It's a single sheet and it just progresses uh, describing each floor up to the top of the building. And then it does the sort of servants' quarters and the outhouses. And it gives us very, very limited information about, about the materials. And so that's very much in this kind of naming register. And the... And this this contract would have just been uh, it would have been organized by uh, a master carpenter. They would have probably supplied uh, the materials themselves as well. And I mean, it's a legal document. No one's going to read it, you know, for instruction. It's really a legal document to make sure that, you know, the the client gets is going to get what uh, what they expect. Um, and, you know, the, the, contra- the contractor knows what they're going to be paid and mm-hmm. the extent of the work. So you have that and that's being managed effectively by by a, a builder, perhaps with just a small team of workers. And the building is also, it's a, really a known kind, you know, it's the same as the one of, of his neighbours, houses and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of trust involved as well. And mm-hmm. quite possibly no accompanying drawings, don't know in this case. But a few years later you start to get much bigger projects which are run by general contractors. So you now have effectively somebody a bit like the kind of like the factory owner, a a capitalist who is seeking to make money by organizing other people to do building work for them. And at that point, the specification becomes an incredibly important tool in the process of organizing building work and also ensuring if, you, if you're going to make money as a general contractor, you have to be sure that um, the bricklayers will do a decent job, but they won't charge you so much that you can't anymore make any profit. So you the, the specification 
starts to be really, really detailed, uh, it almost acting like a kind of um, instrument to ensure the quality of the work and to allow the general contractor to still uh, make, you know, to make profit. So you see at this point, you suddenly see specifications which are now organised not floor by floor, but but trade by trade. So you'll have a bricklayer's specification, a plumber's specification, a painter's specification, um, and so on. And within those is the beginnings of these process-based clauses. So these much more detailed accounts of 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 how the work is to be done, which are really there to sort of ensure quality. There's also a change in the way, uh, actually it's a detail, it doesn't really matter. There's a change in the way that contractors charge for their work as well, but that's that's another detail. But it's really interesting, it's a really interesting idea. And I'm I'm listening to this, you talk about contractors, talking about specifications and not talking about architects. And I think that's a really fascinating idea that the this process in this process, the architect almost seems absent from the almost the critical part of their production. It's like it's like they're not in. I don't know. Are they involved? I mean, what what does their what is their role in this? Obviously, they write the spec, and <laughs> uh, well, to a certain degree, they write the spec. But I imagine it changes building time. So if you're building a long terrace of Georgian townhouses or a long terrace of Victorian townhouses, the architect probably has very minimal impact, actually. So they write the specification, they hand it over, and and kind of, as you say, the houses are just kind of rolled out. They look like what houses look like. They're produced in the way that houses are produced. The builders are, in a, in a way, trusted, or the contractor is trusted to replicate it. Yes. Then, is that right? I think that is right. And I think then when you get when you get to the change and there isn't trust anymore because mm-hmm. you, you get to this kind of general contractor change. Mm. And the, I mean, the discourse at the time is all about these kind of, you know, wayward, untrustworthy general contractors. It's fascinating. Mm. And then how, you know, how do you produce enough information to secure the quality of of, of the building? So so what you do sort of start to understand the architect as is perhaps less as a designer and more as a producer of information. And Mm. you start to think, well, and of course, I mean, well, certainly when I was working in this little practice, we spent a lot of time writing specifications. Mm. But, you know, you never hear about that, you know, in uni, you never hear about that um, in, you know, in in books. Sometimes we've we've, we've called it, uh, along with um, someone I sometimes write with, Tilo Amhoff, who also has done some research, on the specification we've called it the writing work of architects we always Mm. think about the kind of drawing and designing work so i think yeah it's this it's this enormous sea change in the production of information and you do in the process-based specification is delightful because you know every sort of you know everything that's going to happen on site gets recorded you know Mm. buckets being washed out um you know the inspections that need to be carried out so you do also see the architect constantly sort of in there sometimes it's a surveyor a slightly different role but you see the architect in there kind of checking uh Mm. uh, this work that they've described in the documentation uh beforehand and I suppose that's I mean that's you know uh that production of information has um only uh, escalated um it's yeah i mean coming back to this idea of the capitalist thing um this idea of i mean we're talking about a slow process of modernization really aren't we and and in in the sense not only of uh, technological advance um and informational advance but also in the sense of the alienation of the various kind of disciplines within the building trade like as you say you start writing specs that are just for the joiners and writing specs that are just for the glazers and 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 for the m and e you know it's like for the for the electricians and so on and so forth and the kind of idea of a building as a kind of a holistic entity produced holistically starts to fall apart quite quickly yeah that's i mean that's right it's not something i talk about very much in the book um no. but more recently um 
I've been working on a project uh, with Brazilian uh, scholars and architects. Uh, and we're looking with we've, we've been translating the work of a Bra Brazilian architectural historian and theorist called Sergio Ferro. And he has uh, some really hard hitting things to say uh, about the role of the architect and the role of the drawing, indeed, um, in uh, in, I suppose, um, uh, in this transformation of building into a full blown capitalist uh, endeavor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you can't. We're still not making uh, buildings, you know, in a factory um, where you can kind of control production processes and ensure productivity. So Sergio Ferro is asking, um, he looks very carefully at all of the architect's techniques and makes the case that actually what the techniques are doing, and this is including drawing, are, um, are enabling contractors and developers to make enormous money out of the labor of building buildings. Um, and for Ferro, that splitting up of the trades, uh, so building trades who were working on site together, who were making design decisions uh, together, if you think of sort of Gothic cathedrals as the obvious example, uh, design and uh, information and uh, building were all kind of happening uh, together uh, and in the control of the same group of people. Uh, technical knowledge was very uh, closely guarded uh, in the guilds and so on. So um, builders had a great deal of autonomy. And for Ferro, what he understands, the production of all these forms of information um, takes away the autonomy of, uh, of uh, building workers to make those decisions and uh, also, I suppose, to, you know, to keep the financial uh, rewards of their endeavours um, and sort of redistributes, um, redistributes it. So he very much sees uh, it's a very hard hitting analysis, but he would very much see um, uh, all those sorts of documents that we and information as as gradually, uh, gradually sort of um, yeah taking away uh, mm. uh people's power to um yeah. i mean this might be a good moment to plug your production studies 2024 transforming knowledges and of architecture design and labor conference next year in march um which does look really really good and and and, and at which um obviously sergio ferro is giving the keynote so um and which you're organizing i i assume yes we're we're busy organizing that at the moment Yes, yeah, so we hope that this will be um, a, a big international conference, uh, starting with some of uh, Sergio Ferro's ideas, but really thinking about these questions about the production of the built environment. Uh, also, you know, hoping to think about kind of more emancipatory ways that people can build, yeah. uh, as well as you know, uh, 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 providing uh, critique. Um, uh, bringing, I suppose, the kind of labour and production of building to the forefront uh, mm -hmm. uh, over its design, but always interested in the interrelationship. I, I'm really interested in this idea of, of of as architects get squeezed, this 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 reciprocity that you talk about in this kind of first phase of the specification as you were exploring it and analysing it, there's a kind of uh, uh, implicit reciprocity between the builder and the tradesman and and the the, the, the um the, sorry the architect the builder the tradesman and um and i was i'm reminded of a story i read about brunelleschi when he was building the duomo in, in florence and and would actually go to the quarries and actually draw on the stone the shapes that he needed by hand um which is po probably apocryphal but it's a delightful apoc apocryphal story, which I am determined to believe. Um, They're renowned for, for very cleverly smashing uh, a strike by the construction workers. So there's oh, well, lots of very interesting stories. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, go on. Uh, but 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 um but this um I'm also so the architect gets kind of squeezed a little bit. But I wonder if you've thought the specification strikes me as becoming increasingly like a design object in a way, like it it starts performing in a designly way. In this second phase that you talk about, this um, the specification that emerges in the late 18th century, yeah. where you're starting to get the architect actually detailing what the 
mortar mixes are supposed to be. And like, I mean, I've worked on specifications like this myself. It, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, and I, well, I think that they're more like when you're doing private residential, you're doing, you're working with smaller contractors, you're doing kind of very bespoke work. And I suspect because I was the last architects that, yeah, the two last architects I worked at, one did historical stuff and that, mm -hmm. and that form of specification is still very much there where yeah. you're talking, you know, where you're doing a restoration on grade one listed buildings and, you know, the, the heritage bodies want to know that the mortar is containing the right levels of lime and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The hammer, hammering effect on the, on the, the granite is, is going to be, um, and it does become like a design exercise. Like you have to think about it in a designerly way. It's like thinking about what well, you've done the drawings and you've dotted in. So the bricks look like they're a certain type of brick. And then all of a sudden you have to write it. Mm -hmm. That's right. There's something really interesting, isn't there, about about the the language you have to use, the fact that you can have temporality in it as well. So you can think of it as a, a process of a, a sequence mm -hmm. of what it's not just what the thing is going to be like, but how you know how you would uh, arrive at it. Mm. I mean, I. Yeah, and I, I think um, I mean, I have a it, 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 it's it, there's it's total speculation but i have a bit of a fantasy that um you know the fact that you get sort of all these uh uh architects in the 19th century really interested in the craft of of craft of building uh, you know then there's pugin and you know william morris and and so on I I I had this kind of fantasy that it actually comes out of the fact that they were sitting in their offices writing these you know very very rich process clauses where they where you really are thinking about the uh, the fabrication and the making of buildings. So mm. although on the one hand what it's doing is alienating, um, you know, if if we sort of uh, take this kind of Ferro's analysis, but if it, it's alienating the workers in in many ways and. Uh, um, making their lives less satisfactory i think it sort of produces for architects a closeness or a yearning um for the for the actual kind of um or an engagement with the actual uh making and fabrication of building mm. i suppose i mean could you know even be like politically transforming could make you think much more also about the people that really do build stuff yeah. um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It, I mean, it reminded me when I was reading the book, it reminded me, and this idea of the detailed specification reminded me, and this sounds gloriously pretentious, so I like it, um, of uh, Tennessee Williams' stage directions in Cat in a Hot Tin Roof and uh, Streetcar Named Desire, where you get this peculiar thing where he's actually defining exactly how they come onto the stage, what they're deportment is uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, exactly what point it's like really interesting like it's not the 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 architect in the in this term of specification is becoming like the uh, the artist and you you do mention this idea uh, this transformation of the architect away from a kind of al uh, allied um building industry professional to mm. something that is something different to an artist to a they sort of separate themselves so it's in a way there's this peculiar thing where both they are being separated from the, the this kind of engagement with the production of the building but they're mm -hmm. also doing it to themselves they kind of will it upon themselves yeah so for sure um yeah so there's something really important about the the what you're doing when you're drawing or what you're doing mm -hmm. even when you're writing in an office is uh is a different is is a is giving you a professional status um mm. uh that's very different i mean you also get the emergence don't you of the professionalization of the uh, of architecture like in mm -hmm. i think it's in the 1830s that the riba is established so this whole i mean gradually sort of over those uh centuries you know sort of since gothic sort of rena re renaissance period where the architect emerges in europe you're gradually getting the professionalization of the architect lifting themselves out of the world of building and i mean interestingly um 
the townhouse that I was talking about, the um, the guy who's the the so-called architect. Uh, there is an architect uh, who writes the specification, if you like. Um, he's you know who he's somebody who has been. I forget if it was a carpenter or a, a, a mason, I think a carpenter. And, and like many in the 18th century who sort of call themselves architects, they've come out of uh, being builders uh, originally. Um, and that, of course, changes in the 19th and 20th centuries. It becomes something you go and study at university and that kind of gulf uh, is much, much uh, wider. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the issue around professional versus lay knowledge seems to permeate the whole the whole discourse as uh, the whole sort of discourse as well in in the idea of an integrated lay knowledge that is characteristic and maybe this goes back to some of your uh, your your um experiences in, in informal settlements the the kind of the way that stuff is produced and knowledge is communicated is very distinct um, and professional knowledge is very is a very distinct form of knowledge. I mean, uh, the architect has credibility because of their professional status, which guarantees, in this case, technical knowledge around how to describe the correct materials for a condition. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like yeah, it's like, right. and it's taking. I mean, it's in a sim simple sort of way. It's taking the know-how away. It the the architect now has the know-how, um, the right language with which to. Uh, it's a very peculiar stilted language, you know, mm -hmm. in the specification, a sort of legalese as well, um, you know, with lots of hereby's and you know, so. Yeah, yeah. And weird uh, sort of 17th, 18th century language. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so, yeah, so there's something, something definitely happens there. Mm. And, and, and I mean, but coming forward to the present day, I think what's, um, and if you've written, uh, you know, or even tried to make sense of um, performance based specifications, the, so these, you know, now use, I mean, they describe things. In when, does the when does the performance space specification come in? You Around the 60s and 70s when we're starting to, and, and what causes it? I think perhaps that's a good position to start with. Okay. So, well, in fact, I mean, in fact, it, it emerges much earlier, say, in the US than it does in the UK. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's sort of being uh, discussed uh in in the 70s um mm. so i suppose there's a desire um i i think largely i mean there's a sort of scientific you know scientification there's uh of uh of the building industry so mm -hmm. that's kind of happening anyway and the rationalization of building um so on the one hand and we've got the development of material science which is what yeah. makes performance specification possible mm -hmm. um but i think what really uh pushes uh performance specification is you know is two forces and i'm not sure i've got exactly the answer about why it uh, you know why it happens at that particular time or where where the forces come from and it and it's slow um but there are two things so one is to avoid litigation so if i say you know in the specification you know you've got to use uh this particular um concrete mix and then well we've got a good example of it at the moment with uh with rack um and i say you've got to use this and then it turns out to fail uh, and I'm the architect that specified it, then it's my responsibility and the liability falls on me. Um, so one, so using the performance specification, you don't name the material anymore. Uh, uh, what you do instead is say that the, uh, the material to be used must meet a certain set of criteria. And then that pushes uh, that responsibility um, away onto you know to other places 
I mean, interestingly, there are, I mean, there are other issues. If you don't name the material um, in that way, uh, there's also kind of questions around competition. So um, really interesting as well. If I name a material in the specification, um, I'm, you know, giving, uh, I'm making a sale on behalf of a, uh, a manufacturer as well. So uh, there's kind of, so sometimes um, naming materials is avoided, um, I think, in specifications in Europe, for example, because of competition law. Uh, so it's always open uh, which uh, which product or material you use. And um, and then the third reason is it's it can be really good for contractors. So it means that for a contractor, uh, they can choose the most expedient or perhaps they've got a deal uh you know with a particular manufacturer and they can get a you know good discount they can choose the materials that um that they work with so there are kind of lots and lots of reasons for specifying through a material by by the criteria it's meant to meet um uh or how it's going to it's got to behave in the building rather than by naming it um mm. yeah yeah um I'm aware of time. I'm rack, by the way, for anybody listening outside the British news concept uh, co context is reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, which was put in buildings from the mid 20th century through to the 90s and is now starting to fail. Um, <clears throat> and God knows what the outcome of all of this will be, but there's a lot of buildings involved in it. Um, your book, your book deals with as you mentioned at the beginning, Gilbert Simondon, um, and not deals with it, it structures itself around his um, approach to ma to materials, to stuff. Perhaps it would be good, I suppose, to understand this because it's not a it's not a the theorists that architects in general particularly in education tend to circulate around a small uh, are a small number and he ain't one of them <laughs> but maybe he should be well yeah yeah uh he should be and i think i think there are more people uh reading simons on now and and very happily um when i started getting very interested in Simon Don, his work hadn't been translated into English from the original French, uh, and uh, it it now is. So that makes it much more accessible mm -hmm. uh, to, um, to anyone who's interested to find out more about him. Interestingly, the people that were reading, uh, the architects that were reading Simon Don when I was uh, in the early days of this research were in French, French speaking Canada, which is quite, you know, is quite yeah. interesting. So there was a little bit of kind of following there and there was some really interesting early um, stuff on bricks and concrete mm -hmm. uh, that was coming out of, um, of their interests. Um, I mean, Siwon Don's kind of known for two things and one makes him obvious uh, as uh, a philosopher that might be of interest to architects, which is that he was a kind of philosopher of technology and he had some really interesting ways of looking at, uh, let's say, the evolution of technical objects uh, but also he wanted to make a very strong case um, uh, that we that we think about aesthetic culture but we don't think enough and value enough technical culture and and that's uh, really compelling uh, in his work so he's got a big book which is the mode of existence of technical objects which is probably the first one you'd go to if you were going to read Simon Don um, and that finishes with uh, an example that was incredibly important to me, this example about uh, um, a, a lump of wet clay being moulded uh, in a brick mould. Um, and then there's a much, uh, I suppose, uh, another big body of work, which is about uh, individuation. And that, to put it simply, is about how things come into being. And um, again, really, I suppose, if I'm to ask myself, why was Simon Don so important for my interests? It's because for Simon Don, it was really important not just to look at kind of uh, things as static and as structures, 
uh, but to always ask about how things come into being, what uh, about processes. And so he tries to develop a philosophy around process. Um, and you can see that if you're interested in the production of things or the life cycle of things, then uh, his his way of uh, thinking and approaching the world is incredibly uh, rich and interesting. Um, and how do you how do you leverage this with regards this um, this study of specifications? How is this then used? How do you use it? Ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> in five minutes. Um, well, I'll, I'll start just by saying so. In the first, um, um, I'm just thinking. Okay, okay. Well, let's start with the with the brick mold and yeah. um, which is a uh, you know it's a really beautiful it's a really beautiful motif. So I'd like yeah, I'd yeah. like to think about. That. Okay, so let's um, so let's think about uh, somebody um, you know pushing some wet clay into a brick mold. Uh, they take and then they take the brick mold. This is long. You know, we're not even thinking about firing the brick at this point. And out comes a perfectly rectangular. Uh, you know. Um, brick-shaped uh, piece of clay. And uh, what Simondon thinks is this is a perfect sort of example of something with a very long historical, an idea with a very, very long kind of historical uh, uh, tradition. And that's uh, the idea that form shapes matter or that in any object there's a kind of there's form and there's matter and this is an idea that is so beloved of architects and you can even see it with the kind of split between the drawing and the specification that you know you've got uh, uh, the drawing describes the form and then that you know we'll leave describing the sort of matter part to the specification um, and but what that leaves us with is this sort of very well, two things, a very sort of static idea about objects that they're sort of spit into this form and matter. Uh, but also what Simondon wants to show as a false idea is that almost form imprints itself on matter. And what he then goes on to show through this really long, extended, beautiful example, which reminded me a lot of concrete specifications, in fact, is that what's actually happening inside the brick mold is something very different. The, the clay has been kneaded, it's got a particular kind of molecular structure and it's been kneaded and all of this energy has been pushed through the kneading into the clay. So it's like full of this kind of uh, potential energy and, uh, and, it, and, and it's sort of expanding. And when you put the mold on it, you just sort of, you just limit the, the expanding uh, process. So that makes us think of it much more as both as a sort of uh, a process um, and of something which is happening between the brick and and uh, and the um, the mold, if you like. And so in a sense, he needs to do that to show us that the form matter thing doesn't, you know, is, is a is a misunderstanding of what's happening and that allows him then to think in this much more so sort of processual uh relational way about um about about things things in the world um mm -hmm. and so in that way i think it is really really interesting uh for architects as a sort of means to um to allow kind of uh, these long, uh, long processes, if you like, into the way that we understand mm -hmm. the built environment, I guess, or what yeah. we're doing. I, um, I'm, yeah, I think this is a, a really fascinating idea. And I was, I had to do a tiny presentation to the incoming students this Freshers Week, or Welcome mm -hmm. Week, as we now call it. Mm-hmm. It's not as exciting sounding, is it? Um, <laughs> not as drunk sounding, no. <laughs> yeah, perhaps that's a good thing. Perhaps that's a good thing. Um, and I was thinking about a big piece of cast concrete, and having been reading your book, I, I started thinking about the performance. It's a, it's a tidal pool on the on the coast uh, at, at Margate, and um, it's a, you know, meter and a half, two meters wide, and it's just flat, and it. It um, encompasses about four hectares of water. 
and uh, it's lovely and it's transformative. And I was starting to think about in a weird kind of way, and I, 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 you'll, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but there's an implication in what Simondon is saying that grants considerable agency to materials themselves, that, that the architecture, that the materials used in architecture are in a way, in some way, I'm not sure, sort of co-authors of the nature and character of the building. And that I suppose that's perhaps off piste in terms of your book around the specification, but but perhaps but, but perhaps it's not in that insofar as when we get to this performance um this performance based specification we're starting to see a move away from an instrumentalizing of materials towards something that is kind of like and allowing the materials to have their agency in this process is that does that make sense am i barking up the wrong tree here um i think no i think i mean i think you're absolutely right um that say uh it, that it's really important that yeah the material isn't passive it's not merely um it it's not merely sort of uh um what, what would you call it i don't know but just a kind of you know a, a, a background or a sort mm -hmm. of substrate for uh you know for something else um for having form applied to it yeah and i mean i mean i think for a lot there are a number of architects that have been very interested i mean uh, more and more and more so and especially now that you know people are making kind of living materials and experimenting in all kinds of ways now mm -hmm. uh with um uh you know with using bacteria in concrete and all kinds of interesting things like that so i think that idea that ma materials have agency um e even a kind of intelligence a capacity for self organization all of those mm. things i think they're they're very rich and they certainly um are given a kind of um um you know, and though though Simondon is helpful for for those ideas too, um, but but yeah, I but, think it's yeah, I think it's sort of, I think what's really interesting for me. So I mean, I somebody said to me that what I do um, with Simondon's work is he, he writes about technical objects, so he doesn't only he writes about living things too, and you know. Uh, uh, human beings and uh, cellular organisms but the bit that I'm most interested in is when he's talking about technical objects and somebody once said to me that what I do is I think about the material as about materials as technical objects so yes they so they so let's say like any other sort of technical thing that we that we make um uh, so they're not just the kind of raw material for something else, but they're something uh, which, if you like, and increasingly that we that we design or we produce for particular uh, for for you know to be used in particular ways, um, and so that that means that they have agency, but they're also kind of invested with all sorts of um, you know. Uh, uh, forces and ideas uh, that themselves, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose it's not just that they're kind of, you know, they've got some kind of, you know, inert uh, capacities, but also that we've in some way kind of uh, engineered them. Uh, we've made them, we've made them um, like say in the case of the clay and the brick mold, We've, you know, that clay has been processed uh, in and refined uh, in such a way that it can be shaped by the mould. So it's already kind of all sorts of expectations in it about uh, how it'll be used, what it, you know, what it can do and so mm -hmm. on. So I think that those are some of being really attentive about what those expectations are are what those processes are that shape uh materials um i think it's it's 
being attentive to that is mm. is is uh is the key is the key yeah yeah and is that is that that so we're in this phase of the performance specification as you call it like I, mm -hmm. you know, where, where you, it, it, you have to write down it's got to be c24 softwood timber and that's all you put down um and that means it has to come from finland or norway because that's where that grows or probably canada because probably everything grows in canada but um we, we we're moving away so this this idea of the performance specification sort of abstracting architects from the process and allowing us to be as designers um to, to act without in a way due reverence for the character of the materials and the means of their production and the consequences that come from that so we can do things and you you talked in your notes that your wonderful notes that you sent to me about um gl glazing um performance engineered glazing for example which then <clears throat> which is obviously a a, a a unit of globalized uh production so so i'm i'm kind of i, I guess i'm kind of get get trying myself to get my head around this whole idea because as i said it's sort of been completely outside my ken in terms of how i've thought about materials before so the performance so the performance specification is what we do it abstracts us from the processes of the materials themselves and this is problematic and this or is so question is this problematic and if it is problematic what can we take from your particular book and how might it modify our practices okay so so yeah just to think about um the performance specification and i choose performance engineered glass as a, a nice case to look at it through so if performance engineered glass is you know literally made up of layers that do you know at the micro scale that do different things so one might um, stop solar gain um, you know another might have a sort of an acoustic layer another might make the glass strong so that mm -hmm. you know if a, a dart comes and punctures a ship well you know fracture in a you know won't fracture or will fracture or whatever so so and and so it's very very carefully um, engineered for very these very specific different performances. So so you know I can choose you know if I need to uh, have soundproof glass then I can choose exactly to what extent uh, I need it depending on what um, is going to happen in the room that um, I'm specifying my glass for. Um, so. And those, so those two things: how you, you know, how you specify the glass, if you like, what you're, how you're able to specify it, uh, go hand in hand with the fact that this type of glass exists. I mean, um, uh, I suppose, um, and that means that as a specifier. I don't even have to necessarily say that what I'm specifying is glass. I just need to say, look, I want this kind of transparent barrier uh between my two rooms um in fact in many situations as, as we've said i mustn't uh actually say what material i want so i don't say you know who the manufacturer of the glass or even you know it could be that it's a plastic that will do exactly the same job um uh so so you're not in effect, effectively really specifying the material you're specifying how it's going to you know the things it must do for the particular environment you're talking about and that includes sort of aesthetic things as well doesn't it you know as an architect you might say i need it to be i there, there was there's a couple of examples i can think of uh, yeah. where, uh, in a in a famous london gigantic london uh uh art gallery the original specification for a handrail in it 
which the architect chucked down, would have used the entire global supply of that particular wood because it was oh, okay. It was a hard one. So instead, they used pine and painted it the right color. I see. Okay. <laughs> or well, you know, some other hardwood and painted it. The these, right these, uh, somewhere in the book, I write about it because it's so fascinating. So in these. Um, in the sort of most extreme versions of the performance specification, they have this fantastic phrase called visual intent, where what you can do is describe the visual intent yeah. of uh, whatever material it is you're going to use. So that's kind of, yeah, exactly that, you know, at least could it be the right colour if it... Um, uh, so I suppose what that, I mean, very literally, that means as an architect, you you don't, you're, you don't have control over what the material mm -hmm. uh, is uh, going to be. Um, so yeah, there are a whole range of problems that come out of that, you know, I suppose you, you know, if you, if you want to make sure that in, you know, it hasn't used, uh, certain chemicals or it hasn't used some kind of, uh, labor, um, that you don't approve of, I suppose you could make, maybe make that part of the specification too, but effectively you're not, you know, you're not, you're just not in, in, in control of those, um, uh, of those decisions yeah um and that's advantaged as you pointed out you know that's this goes back to this idea of the organization of the building industry that has been to the great advantage of this profit-driven highly profit-driven model where if you can extract the kind of designerly and ethical imperative that actually is part of the professional architect's social obligation as a professional to do good to make beautiful things if you can extract that out and get them to specify in this generic way as a as a kind of bill you know uber builder uber contractor mm -hmm. you can subvert that process and it, who who the hell cares who's making it and where it's being and you know that that rainforest has been cut down or orangutans been shot or whatever it is or that yeah trillions of tons of bauxite are having to be mined to make your windows um that's right and, and 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 the sort of vice versa of that is that the if if there's an obligation for all the kind of legal reasons we've talked about or because you, you because the contractor is insisting on a design and build contract if there's an obligation if you must use performance specification there are also a whole range of materials you can't use because of the requirement to performance specify something, you have to be able to test it in particular ways that uh, that you can evidence uh, that you know that the samples of all samples of this material will behave in a certain way. Mm -hmm. so there's it also mitigates against um, you know a whole range of uh, materials as well. So it's sort of uh, you know great for huge uh, uh, multi, you know global. Uh, uh, Producers of materials and mm -hmm. uh, you know poor for kind of experimental uh, materials that you might want to you know give a go um, mm. on a on a small site. So um, and in that way, uh, it's it's you know much more. It, it's really, I mean, it's really insidious. I suppose it really plants kind of um, material use, uh, you know, as as being something about big business. Um, but you did ask about, well, what can you do about it? <laughs> and in the most simple way, I mean, this is it's a favourite phrase and it's the last the title of the last chapter of the mm -hmm. book. It's what Simon Don asks us to do. He says you have to go into the mould. Uh, so, you know, if you want to understand what's going on with that clay brick, you can't just keep making the clay bricks. Uh, you have to sort of try and understand what's happening. And I think that in that way, we uh, we just need to not you know, um, need to try and understand the sort of, uh, in a way, what's hidden behind these simple, you know, normally we just make a, nowadays you'll just do a, prepare a specification uh, using software and you'll just probably make a series of decisions. Mostly the software is making them for you or you might farm it out to a specifier I suppose the thing is just to try and make, uh, you know, to, to try and understand what those processes are, where you might want to intervene, um, how you can do things differently. I mean, you know, the performance specification is so beautiful. I have like an example of uh, one a performance specification in the book from a 19th century uh, spec. And it's uh, that the the this this 
floor should be made out of timber such that it will be traversed for dancing. And it's just so beautiful. I mean, the idea that, you know, that you specify something for what how it's going to be used is really beautiful, potentially. Um, it's only the way that it's kind of, you know, situated in, um, uh, you know, in in the kind of big business of the building industry that's um uh that it's its problem so mm. i sort of think as well that you know you if you start to think about um these different ways of giving information different ways of describing um your buildings there's also like all sorts of room for an in, you know invention and uh creativity as well so um but i think it's just not it, it or yeah you know or this other term, you know, to go inside the black box. Don't, you know, don't think, well, that's just technical. It's not, you know, it's not interesting. I don't need to know about it. It's being decided somewhere else. It's, I suppose, really uh, the opportunity to engage uh, with those sorts of questions. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a wonderful point to stop on. All right. Me said architecture starts when you carefully put two bricks together, but he was wrong. And Katie's right. It starts well before then. Thanks to her for the conversation and to Bloomsbury for the book. It's a lovely edition. Links to it and to Katie's professional and social profiles are in the podcast description, as is a link to the Production Studies Conference website. There's still time to book a place. Thanks for listening.